and mem memorialized people or the event itself in some manner. Uh, sometimes a monument is built. Uh, sometimes it may be a statue or even a holiday that would be set to set aside to remember and to memorialize uh, these things. We think of heroes, uh, whether it be a wartime hero or some other person who contributed greatly uh, to humankind. Uh, I have a few here that we would show. The children of Israel, uh, when they crossed into the Holy Land, uh, God dried up the waters of the Jordan for them. And they were told that while the waters were out and it was dry to put 12 stones inside the riverbank, and perhaps they came up high enough where you could see them even after the water returned, and then to put another similar structure on the side so that people could remember what God had done for them. Uh, and so we also know that in our own culture, uh, we have different memorials. Uh, we have the Revolutionary War all through uh, the Northeast, uh, around the New England, Boston area. We have uh, the Revolutionary War memorialized. Also, uh, we have others <clears throat> from uh, the Civil War. And you can go north or south of the Mason-Dixon line, and there are many Civil War memorials. I've been to several of them. Perhaps you have as well. <clears throat> and then we have also, coming through history in our country, we memorialize certain famous individuals. Uh, Washington. Uh, this is the Washington Monument, as you recognize it. Uh, for George Washington. And then also, uh, one of my favorites is the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go to Washington, D.C. and take a tour of the Lincoln Memorial, don't just look at it. Go in there and read. Read the things that are written in there. It will, it will move you. It will inspire you. So we have memorials to men <clears throat> such as he. And then we have also uh, World War I memorialized in D.C. and then World War II as well. And so we have these memorials uh, that we have uh, in our country to memorialize. We have the Vietnam Wall, I believe, as well, in this list. Nope, didn't make that one. Okay, but I've been to that one. Maybe you have too. And so before we bring the last slide, I want to introduce our subject today, that there is an ultimate memorial that will be visible, that will be recognizable, and will stand for something that is the most important thing that ever happened in the history of humanity. And even after God makes all things new, even after the world is remade, the Bible says that this present world will all be destroyed with fire and smoke. But God will make a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Even at that time, this memorial uh, will exist. We will be reminded about the greatest sacrifice that was ever made. And that is the sacrifice the Lord Jesus Christ made for your salvation and mine. And this ultimate memorial will be the scars on the hands uh, of Jesus. And we see this will be forever. Now, some have said, well, will Jesus still have the scars? I believe he will. And I'll, I have several reasons for believing this and that we will bring out in the course of this message. Uh, it is interesting to me that Jesus' body, as we understand what happened to him, that he was beaten terribly. Uh, his back, for instance, was totally shredded with the, the scourging that he went through. Those would have been scars, of course. Uh, he was beaten uh, on at least two occasions by angry guards who uh, took it upon themselves to pound him in the face and beat him and pluck out his beard. Uh, they also put a crown of thorns on his head and pounded it into his scalp. That would have pierced and made scars. Uh, so Jesus was really scarred from head to toe. And yet when he was resurrected, the only scars that are mentioned are those that are in his hands and in his side. Now we assume he may have had the scars in his feet as well, but they're not mentioned. But his hands and his side still had those scars. And so we see that this is something that I believe will last. Uh, most of the people that I have read after and studied uh, agree that these are part of who Jesus is today, uh, that he uh, uh, kept these scars for a reason, and that he will perpetually keep these scars and for the same reasons. Uh, one of my favorite authors, Randy Alcorn, said this. He said, I believe Jesus will always have those scars in his hands and feet. Uh, in Revelation, in his glorified body, he is repeatedly called the Lamb who had been slain. So there is a, a, a physical remembrance that he had been slain. The continuity between his risen body and his glorified body once he ascended to heaven seems to be there. 
And so let's talk about these scars. First of all, in Psalm 22 and verse 16, we have a prophecy. Now understand that in the Old Testament times, crucifixion had not been uh, invented yet. Uh, they, they put people to death in the Old Testament by stoning or such as military action. Uh, but crucifixion was invented by the Romans uh, many hundreds of years later. But it is interesting that in the Old Testament, there is prophetic evidence of uh, crucifixion. Uh, one of them is this passage right here, Psalm 22, verse 16. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. This was how they uh, conducted crucifixion, to pierce the hands and the feet. Uh, another passage in the Bible, uh, in this uh, place, it says that, that all my bones are out of joint. They look and stare at me. And so when they put someone on the cross and they brought the cross down with the hands uh, nailed such, uh, the, the weight of the body would, would dislocate the bones. And so this is a reference to uh, crucifixion. Also, we find in Zechariah, Zechariah, all the way toward the end of the Old Testament, right before Malachi, we come to chapter 12 and verse 10. And we see an interesting passage of Scripture that points to what I believe is the reality that even in the future, uh, the scars in Jesus' hands will remain as a memorial. Uh, this passage says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace, of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they pierced. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Now this is a prophecy, and we know it's future because it hasn't happened yet. Everything in the Bible that is said will happen, will happen unless it has already happened. If it's already a fulfilled scripture, it did happen. If this is a prophecy, and it is, and it hasn't happened, then it will. Now, it hasn't happened up to this point in time, which means that it is yet future, which means that if they look upon him whom they have pierced, then the implication is very strong that he will be someone who obviously was pierced, and they will see him. I, th I see the scene in this light. Jesus comes again. He comes again in glory. Now, when the rapture comes, the Bible says he comes as a thief in the night, and, he, and, and, and the world doesn't see him, but we are caught up together with him. But seven years later, the Bible says he comes visibly from the sky with great glory and with a host of angels and comes to this earth, and he puts his foot on the Mount of Olives. Now, can you think with me as the, the, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel there in that land, uh, see someone coming from a, a great distance away, and it's just a speck in the sky, but that speck gets larger, and it gets larger, and pretty soon they're able to see that this is a person uh, and as this person gets closer and closer and closer, they, they begin to see someone in, in great glory and splendor, and yet he gets closer, and then they're able to see more detail, and they see, wow, nail scars, nail scars. Now, can you imagine the rabbis? Can you imagine the religious, religious leaders? Can you imagine those who did not formally believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the one that would come? And now they see him and they realize that was him. That was him. The scars are testimony to the fact that we rejected him. And then they will mourn as a nation. And the Bible says all through the Old Testament, there will come a time when God will redeem Israel and he will wake them up from their slumber and they will become returned to to God. And I believe it is that vision of seeing Jesus come from the sky and seeing those and they will look those that pierced him. Now here, it, it wasn't just the Jews who pierced him. The Romans pierced him. We all pierced him with our sins. And so the earth will mourn because we realize the price that he paid for our salvation. Now in John chapter 19, we see this also. John chapter 19, verse 36 and 37. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Now Jesus died on the cross and when he died, they, they would often break the legs of people they crucified so they, they could no longer push up and, and, and breathe and continue to live. If they broke their legs, they would die very shortly after that. But when they came to Jesus, he'd already died. 
And so instead of breaking his legs, they pierced his side. So notice what it says. And again, another scripture, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Now, this passage in John, which is in the New Testament, of course, ties in directly to the passage in Zechariah, showing beyond all doubt that this is a messianic prophecy. When the New Testament says this is about that, then this is about that. And so this was all about Jesus. Now, we also know that when Jesus rose again, he had a glorified body. His body was not emaciated. I don't believe Jesus had a shredded back. I don't believe he had a disfigured face. I don't believe the other scars that are on him were outstanding in him. I believe he was restored to perfect health. He could have had every one of the scars in his body to heal up. That could have been how it is. Listen, when I get to heaven, I hope I don't have the scars I have now there. When you get to heaven, I bet you've got some scars that you hope disappear as well. And I believe they will. We will have a glorified body. Listen, when I get to heaven, I'm gonna, I know that it's in the twinkling of an eye. We won't have time to do it. But if I had time on the way up in the rapture, I would like to take these glasses off and wad them up and throw them down as I go up to heaven because I'm tired of wearing glasses. I have to have them now. I won't have to have them then. The imperfections of our bodies now, this wreck of a body that we walk around with, and by the way, none of us are getting better with age, are we? We're going to trade in for a new one. And the new one will be good. Now, Jesus could have had his resurrection body, his glorified body, be completely absent of any scars. He could have done that easily. I believe he'll do that for you and me. But he didn't. When he came back and presented himself alive, he had those scars. He kept them. All right? Now, John chapter 20, verse 24. Here is how we know this is so. John chapter 20, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now Thomas was a hardcore doubter. I mean, he didn't want to just see. He wanted to, put, he wanted to put his finger in those nail prints. He wanted to put his hand in that wound in the side. Until I know it's him, until I know it's actually his body, I'm not going to believe. All right? And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. You see, Jesus still had those scars in his hands. And reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. So when Jesus came, he said, here's my, here's my scars. Touch them. Here's my side. Touch it. And, and so what did Thomas do? Notice, uh, Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Now, I believe that not only did Jesus resurrect with the scars and present himself that way to his disciples, I believe he ascended with the scars, and I believe he will descend with these same scars. Let's turn to a book that is about the future, Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. This book is about uh, prophecy, about the end times, that which should come. And again, we find, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. Now, this passage could have said those who crucified him, <clears throat> those who slew him, those who killed him, but in particular, it says those who pierced him. And I believe that is important because what it is referring to is when he comes again, it will be obvious that he was the one who was pierced. The Bible presents Jesus Christ as a lamb that had been slain. So this memorial that we have of Jesus Christ is, I believe, an eternal memorial. Now, why did Jesus keep the scars? What are the reasons why he kept the scars? I, I have four, and I believe there are others, but I'm going to deal with these four this morning. First of all, 
these scars that we will have that will be part of Jesus' glorified body forever uh, display his incarnation. You see, a spirit can't have scars because a spirit doesn't have a body. Jesus was more than just a spirit. Uh, Jesus, when he appeared to his disciples in one place, he said, here, touch me and handle me, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as I have. Jesus wanted them to know that this wasn't a vision. This wasn't some just ghostly uh, appearance, that this was him. He had a body. And so the scars display his incarnation. Uh, the Bible says in John 1:14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the scars demonstrate for all eternity the incarnation, that God became a man. And so this will be a lesson for all time. Also, the scars remind us of why Jesus came. It is to be a sacrifice for us. In Matthew 20, verse 28, he says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And so these scars tell us that he has a body, that he was incarnated as a man. These scars tell us also of the purpose that he came, the reason for his coming to earth. The scars also, number three, will remind us that he suffered. Now only a human can suffer in this way. Uh, Jesus had to have a body so it would experience pain. Uh, he felt uh, our pain. He understands our pain. He is a high priest and therefore he identified with us. He knew the pain that we know and even more. So he identifies with us. So these scars remind us of his sufferings. Now I think in my mind's eye as we are in heaven and we are in our glorified bodies and we see Jesus on the throne of glory and he is there uh, with many crowns and we see that the scars are in his hands to remain. We will always remember. We will always remember. He's our Savior. He is the one who uh, stretched out his hands and showed his love for us and, and took our place. And then number four, the scars testify forever. Listen, the price has been paid. This, this is like the receipt, if you will. You know, sometimes if you want to show that, that something's been paid for, you produce documentation. You say, well, here's the receipt. Uh, my wife's a bookkeeper. She, she's very diligent with these kind of things. And sometimes, uh, you know, I, I forget a receipt. And she says, uh, do you know where the receipt is? And I have to go looking. Why? Because it's a record. She keeps these records. We have to do that. Same here with the church. We keep records of receipts. Well, Jesus' scars are the reminder of the price that he paid. And it is evidence that, that it's, it's done. Jesus took our, our place on the cross in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 through 57, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible presents Jesus Christ as the one who paid the debt in full. And therefore, when we see his scars, we are reminded it's done. It's done for all time. You know, Jesus' scars are very personal. When we see those scars, we're reminded personally, you and I personally, he bought me, he redeemed me, he did this for me. We will love him for all eternity uh, because of those scars. There's a story told about an orphan boy who'd been placed in the care of his grandmother. Well, their house caught fire, and the grandmother, trying to get upstairs to rescue the boy, didn't make it, and she died in the flames. And the boy's cries for help were finally answered by a man who came and climbed up an iron drain pipe uh, and came down with the boy hanging tightly to his neck. Several weeks later, a public hearing was held to determine who would receive custody of this child. A farmer, a teacher, and the town's wealthiest citizen all gave the reasons why they felt they should be chosen to provide the boy with a home. As they talked, the boy's eyes just remained focused on the floor. He had been traumatized and he had hardly spoken. Then a stranger walked to the front and slowly took his hands from his pockets, revealing the scars on them. As the crowd gasped, the boy cried out in recognition. This was the man who had saved his life and whose hands had been burned when he climbed up that very hot pipe. And with a leap, the boy threw his arms around the man's neck and held on for dear life. 
The other man silently walked away, leaving the boy and his rescuer alone. Those scarred hands had settled the issue. When I think of Jesus and what he did for you and what he did for me, that's the same emotion that that carries. He is the one who is worthy. He is the one who is righteous. He is the one who, who paid the penalty and took my sin upon himself. There's no other memorial given to us that will last forever like this one. Listen, when, when this earth has gone to, to nothing, when all of these wonderful memorials we have built disappear from view, when all of the things that we have made here to remind us of something are gone, uh, this memorial will remain. The scars in the hands of Jesus. And it's interesting. This is the only contribution we made to heaven. There's no building there that we built. There's no structure there that we made. Uh, there's nothing in heaven that was from the work of man. The only thing in heaven today that is from the work of man are those scars. That's our contribution. That's what we made. There'll be no pride in heaven. There'll be no pride in heaven. It will not exist. It will be forever banished because those scars will leave no room for it. Those scars will, need, will leave no possibility for pride to ever arise because every time we see Jesus, we'll be reminded we are unworthy. He did something for us that we did not deserve and he is the one to receive all honor. There's another memorial. There's one Jesus gave us for this time in which we live, the time of the church age. And I believe to a degree this one will carry over into the next world as well. This is that memorial that we refer to as the Lord's Supper or communion. And Jesus gave us this in, uh, after, uh, you know, anticipating his death in Luke chapter 22, verse 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now, what Jesus did, he took the Passover meal and he turned it into something new. He turned it into something for the church. And he said, when you take this bread and when you drink this cup, I want you to remember me. I want you to remember me. Now, folks, that's a, that's a memorial. We have been given a ceremony. We have been given a ritual that was designed by Jesus himself so that we would remember him. And in particular, that we would remember his suffering, that we would remember his sacrifice. Now, the, take that and let's add to that this concept. Jesus also left room in his teachings. The implication is strong that this particular memorial of us having the Lord's table will go into the future as well. I bring your attention to Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. And we'll read through verse 29. And this is the uh, account given in Matthew's gospel. And here's what he said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now here's the interesting part of what he says here in particular. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, that hasn't happened yet. That hasn't happened yet. We read nowhere in the Bible where the kingdom has come. The kingdom is coming. We're praying that prayer still. We're given that prayer to pray. Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That hasn't happened yet. So it's going to happen. So if we understand this passage as Jesus gave it, Jesus said, I'm leaving this with you. You eat this bread. You drink this cup. I'm not going to do it physically. I'm not going to do it in present with you until I come again in the kingdom and then we'll resume this. We'll do it again. And so the implication is, is one day we're going to have communion with Jesus present. One day we're going to have the Lord's table with him at the head of the table. Won't that be a wonderful thing? Now, every now and then I go to a bookstore. 
Uh, and the bookstores typically have beautiful pictures there of, of a religious nature. And perhaps you've seen this picture uh, in, in a lot of these stores where they have this beautiful ornate table and it's long. I mean, it's like it's, it's so long, it's like eternally long. And it has the most beautiful china and the most ornate silverware and all of these things. And at the end of the table, way down there is Jesus himself. And it's the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I think about that. I think about sitting down to have a meal, sitting down uh, with Jesus. Uh, listen, I, I've had a lot of wonderful times with family and friends around the table. One thing we Baptists love, we love to eat. We love to dine. We love to fellowship. Uh, it's like, you know, if, if, if you find Baptists anywhere, you're going to find a casserole. You're going to find some potato salad. You're going to find some fried chicken. You're going to find something. We love to eat together. Why? Because it's like family. We're like family. Well, when we get to heaven, we're going to have the Lord's table with Jesus present. Now his spirit is here and we sense his spirit. But won't it be a wonderful thing to be able to have this with him present and to commemorate and remember his sacrifice. We also find in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, in the formula that the Apostle Paul gave to the church, one that we will read in just a few moments as we have the Lord's table this morning. This is part of that. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-six. He says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death, here it is, till he come. You show the Lord's death till he come. Now this ceremony, this memory, this memorial that we have of Jesus in taking the bread and, and the cup, it is a somber time. It is a serious time. It's a time of reflection. It's the time where maybe we have somewhat of a heavy heart. But it is also, it has an upbeat. It has a, a, a tinge of optimism. Because while we are commemorating his death, we also know he didn't stay dead. He rose again. And he says, I'm coming back. And we're doing this anticipating his return. Listen, if you have a faith, if you have a version of Christianity that has a dead man on a cross and that's that, I want to introduce to you to the risen Savior. He is not only risen, but listen, if you have a faith where he died and he rose again and then he disappeared, I feel sorry for you too. Because we have a faith where he died, was buried, he rose, and he's coming back. And things are going to be right when he comes back. Now, we've got some old people here today. It's okay. You can admit it. You're old. Might as well. It's true. I'm old. I'm not as old as some, but I'm older than I was, and I'm feeling it. So I'm old. Okay? I was young. I know the difference now. Here's the thing. I've been around a while. And here's, here's the reality of it, folks. Everything is one day going to be brand new. I am old and I have never, ever, ever seen this world right. From the time I was born to this present time, this world has been a messed up place. I was oblivious to a lot of it when I was a boy because I didn't watch the news. And by the way, maybe we could do with less news. Sometimes we have less stress. But as a preacher and as a man that feels like I need to know what's going on, I, I try to stay in, informed. But now here's the thing. This world is messed up. It's never been right. But when Jesus comes back, he's going to destroy the works of the devil. He's going to restore everything to newness. The lion will lay down with the lamb. The ox will eat straw along with a lion. And a little child will be able to, to carry a lion and, and, and around by his mane like a pet. That's what the Bible talks about. Why does the Bible use language like that? Because it's true. God's going to make this world again like the Garden of Eden. It's going to be wonderful. Won't it be wonderful to see it like that once in our lives for a thousand years? Now, here's my point. Folks, this memorial that we have all hinges upon what happened on the cross. When Jesus gave his body, when Jesus shed his blood, that made the future possible. Why? Because what we lost in the Garden of Eden, we got back on Calvary's cross. 
Jesus, the second Adam, undid what the first Adam did. Jesus came to pay the penalty, to take it upon himself. He didn't have to do it. He did it for love. He did it for love. He did it because he loves you. Now, don't, let, don't ever let anybody tell you anything different. God is love. The bad things that we see in the world, some of them are hard to explain. Some of those we look at and we wonder. But I'll tell you what, God is love. And one thing we must understand, if God is love, and He is, and if pain exists, and it does, who took the most pain? That God of love took the most pain. I wouldn't plan a plan like that. I wouldn't make a world like that. I wouldn't do that unless there was a big reason. Uh, somebody said, well, what would you like your life to be? How would you like your life to be? You know, I'd say, oh, oh boy, here it is. Here's what I'd like my life to be. I'd never get sick. I'd like my life to be I'd never get injured. I'd like my life to believe, uh, be that I have all health all the time. I'd like to be wealthy. I'd like to have everything go my way. I'd like to have everybody love me. I'd like to have nobody ever want to hit me or, or call me a bad name. Yeah, yeah. You, does anybody ever have that life? If you could choose your life, would you choose the rotten things that happen to you? I think when I'm in the fourth grade, I'd like for two, three bullies just to beat me up. I'll plan that. On this date, three bullets beat me up. No. Well, it happened. <laughs> but I didn't want it. Now listen, I, I don't get to plan my life. Now, now what if you could? What if you could? Would you plan that? Listen, God in eternity past, the Trinity before the foundation of the world, decided within the confines of the Godhead that God himself would come down and suffer more than any being in the universe could ever suffer and feel every bit of it. The only reason that makes any sense at all is love is behind that. God's love. Listen, God loves you as messed up as you are, as sinful as you are, as prone to do wrong as you are, and I am. God loves you. God loves me. And we are humbled by it. We are brought to a point where we should be thankful. Every time we have communion, we are remembering the torn body and the shed blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And at the same time, we are recognizing His promise to come again. So we will now bring ourselves to a time of reflection. 